The Lord be with you. As we come to the time of sermon this morning, let's take a moment to pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day and this time where we gather to meet and try to listen and open ourselves to what you have to say to us. We ask for eyes to see and ears to hear and a readiness to act and to live as you call us. In Jesus' name, Amen. I wonder if anyone here remembers the first time they prayed. Perhaps when they were very young or perhaps when they were a little bit older. I wonder what your strongest memory of that moment might have been. I suspect even if you were very young at the time and you were taught to pray as a child, at that moment I suspect you must have felt something about how much of a strange act this is to do, to pray. That there was something very odd um, and confusing about this act. One of my favourite poems, written by one of my favourite poets, is named America by Allen Ginsberg, that wonderful lyricist of the Beat Generation, that generation of nonconformists who grew up in the shadow of Western consumer culture post-World War II. Ginsberg's poem is a sort of liturgical dialogue between himself and his nation, and he reflects on how so many of the conformist versions of American life, and particularly American Christianity, where children in schools were taught to recite the Lord's Prayer from a very young age, they just seemed so alien and strange to him. Ginsberg poem Ginsberg's poem says, The American flag is absolutely meaningless to me, still just as it was in the 30s. I won't say the Lord's Prayer. I have mystic visions and cosmic vibrations. Ginsberg was no stranger to strangeness. As he writes, I have mystic visions and cosmic vibrations. But the Lord's Prayer? Even Ginsberg's strangeness has a limit. While everyone around him is saying this prayer, reciting this prayer, getting their children to say this prayer, like it's something completely innocuous and normal, Ginsberg seems to be aware of how odd it is and how difficult it is to make sense of it. If prayer is such a strange thing to do, why on earth do we do it? In the reading we heard from Luke today, Jesus' disciples are eavesdropping on his prayers. And they're perhaps both impressed and also confused. Lord, they seem to be saying, this is something we haven't seen before. The way you've just prayed, teach us to pray. Perhaps teach us to pray like that, we might be thinking. For us today, of, as would-be disciples of Jesus, one of, I think, the important questions that the role of the Lord's Prayer throws before us is why do we say it and why do we pray at all? So that's something I'd like to explore with you this morning. Why is it that prayer is so important for us as Christians, and especially the Lord's Prayer? What is so special about the Lord's Prayer? One reason that I think we can begin with is that prayer is the start of faith. Prayer is the beginning of faith. Prayer teaches us to believe. Prayer is a call to discipleship. We don't decide that we believe in God and then pray. We pray first. And as we learn to pray, 
I think we start to learn what it is to believe. I think one of the worst misunderstandings that we so often seem to hear about the person of Jesus Christ is that he was basically like a great moral teacher, a philosopher who offers us a series of ideas and teachings that we might find attractive or appealing. But this kind of Jesus is very much unlike the kind of Jesus that we find in the Gospels. In the final chapter of John's Gospel, for instance, when Jesus is asking, talking to Peter, he says to Peter, do you love me? Note that he doesn't say, do you like my teachings? Do you find what I've said pleasing or agreeable? Or even, do you like me? Do you love me? Ironically, it's also Peter who's correctly identified who Jesus is, the Messiah, the Son of God. But he gets things most wrong in terms of understanding who Jesus really is and what Jesus really wants from us. Discipleship, walking the way of the cross. So learning to pray is a mark of being on this journey of following. The Lord's Prayer isn't an incantation of beliefs so much as it is the practice of a people on the way. To risk a kind of military analogy, I know it's often dangerous to do this in the church, uh, but I think there can be something subversive about it when we try and understand what we're doing. Remember how Paul in Ephesians talks about pushing on the armour of God? Um, sort of like saying, you know, put on, put on uh, you know, the breastplate of justice over and against you know, the breastplates that are worn by the soldiers of the Roman Empire who perpetrate this injustice all around us. I think there's a way we can sometimes use it, even as people committed to peace and non-violence, uh, to speak to what it is we think God is calling us to do and to be. So this military analogy, you've probably seen enough movies, usually American movies, where soldiers are marching around uh, as part of their training and they say some kind of, of rhyming chant to, to march in time with each other. Um, the Lord's Prayer, I think, is kind of our marching chant, isn't it? It's the chant of a people on the way, on the march. William Willimon is an American theologian and he writes that we don't decide to become Christians and then find that the Lord's Prayer is a helpful way of expressing our beliefs. Rather, we don't choose this prayer, it chooses us. It reaches out to us, it forms us and invites us into the adventure that we call discipleship. So just as you're not a soldier for the empire, until you learn to march. You're not a disciple, we might say, you're not a Christian until we start following Jesus. In John's Gospel, Jesus says to his disciples, if you persist in my word, and you are, then you are truly my disciples, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We don't know any fundamental truths about Jesus until we learn to follow. Truth, as the scriptures would have us think of it, is not so much a set of propositions, so much as it is the person of Jesus. As Jesus also says in the fourth gospel, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We don't know what the truth is until we know Jesus. We don't know what it is to be a Christian until we come to know Jesus. And it's the Lord's Prayer and prayer that invites us into relationship with Jesus. So therefore we say that we learn what it is to believe through prayer rather than the other way around. It's prayer that brings us into faith rather than faith that leads us to pray. So that's the first thing. I've suggested. A second reason, I think, as to why it is 
that we pray and specifically why it is that we pray the Lord's Prayer is that it is very possible, I think, to pray wrongly, to pray badly, to pray falsely. This might seem like an awfully mean thing to say. I mean, how can we possibly say to someone, you're not praying right? You know? I think there are actually plenty of circumstances where we wouldn't at all hesitate to say that. Consider the prayers that have been said by chaplains to the Nazi state, chaplains to military dictatorships, uh, the services that are held outside the Pentagon in America, where the people there are asked to, where asking God to, to bless uh, you know, the work that is going on inside that building. How can we not say that there is something really, really wrong? with the way these prayers are said. To use an, an example that's perhaps a bit closer to home, in our federal parliament, the Lord's Prayer is said before the opening of every session, as I understand. And yet, just recently, our parliament seems to be enacting a new policy that seems to be taking the oppression of some of the very people to whom the kingdom of God belongs to a new level. The persecuted, often for the sake of righteousness, the refugee and the asylum seeker. Blessed are, the, are those persecuted for the sake of justice, says the gospel. How dare we say the Lord's Prayer in one breath and then persecute those persecuted for the sake of righteousness? in our next. Surely there is something wrong with saying the prayer in such a fashion. So there are definitely examples and times and places where it, we, where it is possible to pray badly, to pray wrongly. In the world we live in, people offer all sorts of prayers to all sorts of gods. People put their trust in money and wealth and property and power and strength of force. As we've just seen, it is possible to pray the Lord's Prayer wrongly as well. So this is one thing that suggests that we need to be taught to pray. We need to be taught what it is to be a prayerful people. How it is that we can pray right. So I think this leads us towards a third feature about why it is that we pray and why it is that we pray the Lord's Prayer. That we want, to, by doing this, to place ourselves in a community of faith, within a tradition where we draw upon the wisdom of others who've gone before us. Something I hope we will find over the next few weeks um, where I intend to share a bit more of what about the Lord's Prayer with you all is that this prayer is extremely odd. On its own, said as individuals, I think Ginsburg is very right. Prayer, and especially the Lord's Prayer, makes very little sense. There are plenty of people probably plenty of people that you know who have nothing to do with the church or with the Christian faith, but they know the Lord's Prayer. It is saying this prayer as part of the community of faith that helps it to start to make a bit of sense. The prayer is odd because Jesus is odd. So it is only by being part of a community dedicated to following this odd Jesus that this equally odd prayer can start to make a bit of sense. By this I don't mean that it ceases to be odd, though. Jesus not only confronts the world as a stranger, I think sometimes he confronts the church as a stranger as well, saying that what's going on within these walls sometimes is not exactly what Jesus is calling us to be. A church that is convinced that Jesus is at home in their church 
is often a church that is in new need of being evangelised. So, I think for this reason, repeating the Lord's Prayer, saying the words that we did not write ourselves, is a good thing. When we do this, we seem to place ourselves in a tradition. We remind ourselves of the stories of the first evangelists when we repeat it over and over again to ourselves each week. Repetition is good. Praying the Lord's Prayer out of habit, even if we think we might be sometimes absent-minded or not concentrating perfectly on the words as we say them. That's a good thing. Habit is typically what we entrust a whole heap of important things to in our life. Eating, sleeping, making friendly conversation with each other. We do these things by habit because they're too important to leave to chance, right? The important things in our life we don't want to leave to chance. And prayer being as important as it is, we don't want to leave prayer to chance. One thing I think that we are often afraid of, though, in the modern world, is that we have this fear of being unoriginal. That when we're not coming up with something that we've thought of ourselves, we're somehow, we, we often feel a bit sheepish, whether it's in prayers or in sermons or just in conversation. But when it comes down to it, I'm not really sure I've ever said anything original <laughs> in my life. And I think the many uh, rejections I've received from different philosophy journals to whom I've submitted papers will probably attest to that. Um, but sometimes I think, for the, at least for the church, this sense of being original is overrated. Creativity for the church, I think sometimes, is not so much about coming up with your own ideas as it is about forgetting where you heard them. I tell, that's not my own line, I've heard that somewhere else before. i tell you where I got it from, but I forget. <laughs> Throughout the next few weeks, much of what I will share with you, I think, has been said by someone else before, perhaps in this very pulpit, who knows. But if, uh, if God is willing, and perhaps if I'm sufficiently creative, you won't even notice it. So we've heard, I think, three reasons why prayer, and especially the Lord's Prayer, are particularly important. Firstly, we've said that prayer is the beginning of discipleship. Prayer is the beginning of faith. Secondly, we've said that it's quite possible to pray wrongly and to pray badly, and that the Lord's Prayer and the tradition of prayer helps to centre us. And thirdly, we've said that the Lord's Prayer invites us into being part of a community of faith, a tradition, a sense of received wisdom that we did not decide or originate ourselves. I said at the start of this sermon that the Lord's Prayer is strange. I want to finish this morning by commenting on an equally strange feature of the reading that we just heard. And I think that only compounds this, this strangeness of the Lord's Prayer. After Jesus teaches the disciples this prayer, he then tells a series of parables about being spontaneous in prayer. If any of you has a friend that you might call on if you are in need of, of a feed in the middle of the night and your friend says, don't bother me now, your persistence, says Jesus, if not your friend's care for you will win out. It's as if immediately after telling his disciples, pray this prayer, pray these words, he's then also saying, be spontaneous, be shameless, be bold when you pray. Say what is on your heart. But on the other hand, we're also told, you know, Pray these words. How can we be taught to pray while also being told to be shameless and bold when we are praying and say what's on our hearts? 
I don't mean to, I don't want to play down how paradoxical this sounds to us, but I do want to suggest it seems particularly weird and difficult for us to make sense of only because of the culture that we live in. What do I mean by this? Well, I think there is a, a particularly definitive aspect of our culture that says that the only way you can be truly free is to be able to pursue your own wants and your own desires without any restrictions. That the most important part of your identity, of who you are, is the things that you want, your preferences. The most influential philosopher of the last 200 years was a German thinker named Hegel. Hegel anticipated this aspect of the modern world, this idea that to be truly free is to be allowed to go after whatever it is that you want. And he said that there is something really wrong with it. The culture doesn't ask anything about how we come to want the things that we do. Consider, for example, the role of advertising. If so many of the things we really want in life, we only want them because of the influence of advertising over our lives, to what extent is it really us doing this wanting, this longing? Even reasoning about things for Hegel won't quite cut it. Those of you who are parents, I'm sure you've felt the difficulty of arguing with your kids more than once. My own parents, I mean, at some stage in my life, I'm going to have to get down on my knees and ask them for forgiveness. Um, the amount of times I've forced them to argue with me and said, look, I'm sorry, you haven't given me any reasons that have convinced me, so I'm not going to do what you're saying. We all know, I think, that we can come up with reasons to justify what we want. But there's sometimes something very empty and formalistic about saying it's all reasons that matter. Because reasons can, if we're willing, support just about anything we want. Hegel concludes that we can only find real freedom for ourselves and for each other when we are grounded in a community in a tradition of thought and practice, of received wisdom from each other. The community, he says, gives voice to our deepest individuality, to our oddness, to the specificity and the strangeness of what it is that we truly want and truly desire. It expresses our deepest longings and desires. For us in the church, learning to pray the Lord's Prayer is a bit like this. Reciting the Lord's Prayer isn't a way of suppressing the things that are on our hearts, the spontaneous thoughts and concerns that we have. It's a way of giving voice to them. The Lord's Prayer is the longing of the human soul to be returned to right relationship with God and each other. Think of all the supplications in it. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Feed us, forgive us, save us from trial, deliver us from evil. The Lord's Prayer is the cry of a broken humanity. So if the Lord's Prayer strikes us as strange, I suspect it is because we don't yet quite realize how broken we really are. We who are so satisfied with ourselves and our lives and are so used to being able to satisfy even the slightest of our inclinations without any difficulty at all. But with God's help, may we allow the strangeness of this prayer to truly confront us illuminate our brokenness and turn us towards God and towards our true selves. Amen. So from the order of service. And so we are bound to God's word. And to God's word.
As we reflect upon these words, sisters and brothers, let's take time to praise God 